as we get going, I just want to tell you a little bit about Mike. Mike and I were at a conference once where um, uh, one of the men in, took 45 minutes to introduce the, introduce the speaker because the speaker was his dad. And I could take 45 minutes now to introduce Mike, but I won't do that to everybody. I might be driven out of town. Uh, and so let me just begin by giving you a little bit of Mike's background. In 1983, he founded Homeschool Legal Defense Association with his friend, Mike Smith. Uh, he remained president for many, many years. He start, and he is still chairman of the board. He formed, started Patrick Henry College, and he is still chancellor emeritus at Pat Patrick Henry College. He has testified many, many times before the Senate and the House and the United States Supreme Court. He's a consummate communicator and legal expert. And if it weren't for Mike, I would say there may be hundreds of thousands of kids who might not be homeschooled today, maybe millions. His, his work at HSLDA to win the parental rights for us to homeschool has just been groundbreaking. And he would be the first to tell you he had a great team. But Mike was the visionary. He was the one that had this vision and got it done. Uh, Mike and his wife have 10 kids and 26 grandkids at the, at the last count. And they have home, they homeschooled all of their kids all the way through. Now, I think the thing we need to know the most about Mike in our day and time where we've been let down by so many political leaders and also Christian leaders is that Mike is the real deal. He and Vicki have a fabulous marriage. They have a family that has remained close. Mike loves the Lord. He shares Jesus um, with pride and not shame. And he's a real student of the word. Plus, he just he has a heart for encouraging homeschool moms. Um, Mike, I want to bring you up now. And I just want to tell you some of the things we appreciate about you the most. Hey, Mike. Hey, Dan. Good to see you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I know we know you had a thousand other places to be. So thank you. So Mike, I just want to tell you, to me, you're a general in the Lord's army. And I can't imagine this world without you. As a matter of fact, it brings me to tears when I think about all you have done. For me, for so many people like me, you've been our voice. You've been our helper. You've been the 700 pound gorilla in the room that people were afraid to mess with. And we just can't thank you enough. So the verse that comes to mind when I think about you the most is the parable of the sower and the seed. Because I cannot think of anybody that I know or I've, whose teaching I've sat under that has borne more fruit than you have. I wouldn't say it's a hundredfold, maybe a thousandfold or a millionfold. And we just can't thank you enough for that. So I guess I need to tell them a little bit about your work at ADF. Uh, and we're so thankful. I was so sad when you left um, Homeschool Legal Defense Association. But who could see how quickly our country would deteriorate and how much we would need your skills on a much larger scale? So um, if people want to find out more about ADF, they can go to ADFlegal.org. And there's a donate button. There's all kinds of ways you can get involved. I would say it's the premier organization that's fighting for Christian rights and freedom today. Would you agree with that? Is that right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so the largest. Um, so if you don't know the beginning of ADF, in 1993, there were 35 Christian leaders who got together and wanted to start an organization to preserve our rights as Christians, our religious freedoms before it was too late. So thank goodness they had the, um, the vision to do that. And so Mike, thank you for all you're doing worldwide. Thank you for what you're doing nationally. We love you so much and we appreciate all you've done. Well, thank you, Zan. I, I appreciate that so much. Uh, you uh, have been a steadfast friend and a fellow warrior. Uh, many of the early cases that I uh, fought uh, in situations I was involved in. Uh, you were there as a key participant, and I just so appreciate all you've done. So I'm looking forward to, to talking to folks. So uh, we're going to talk more about uh, this. Not There'll be some homeschool elements of the talk today, but uh, we're going to talk mostly about the situation that our country is facing overall and uh, 
what you know why we should have hope in the midst of what looks like on the surface a pretty uh, grim situation so that's right. the goal for the day that's what we need to hear mike we need to hear some some hope from you so thanks so much i'm going to bow out and let you take the stage well thank you okay. appreciate it well uh sp speaking to all of you all um about the situation we face today uh reminds me of um a situation from from history and uh, now it's going to be an unusual one i perhaps no one else would think of this but I wrote a book which included this story uh, many years ago on the history of religious freedom. And there was a, a person that I wrote about fairly extensively. In fact, I dedicated the book to his memory, and his name was Thomas Helwes. Helwes uh, lived in the uh, 15, 16th and 17th century. He, uh, he died around 1612 or 13. Um, and so he was a Baptist pastor. Um, and, uh, and even though I, I, I'm Baptist by background, and even though we like to think that John the Baptist was the first Baptist, uh, uh, perhaps Adam and Eve, perhaps the Apostle Paul, realistically, uh, more truthfully, um, Thomas Hell was the, was the first one. Now, he was a part of a group in England, excuse me, from England that were living in Holland, uh, that they went through as they were exploring uh, the word of God for themselves and out from under the Church of England, um, there were several splits along the way, and one of the group that split off got on a boat called the Mayflower and came to the American uh, shores and uh, started, of course, that uh, famous colony in uh, Plymouth Rock. But Helwes um, stayed in, in Holland for a while, but eventually, around 1610, 1611, he was called to go to England uh, because he they believed that there was not a faithful gospel witness that was in place in England in 1610, 1611. And, um, and so as they were going, um, they were thinking through uh, the situations that they were going to face. And they, they wrote a book about the, uh, or a, a booklet more or less, uh, about the, the kinds of things that they wanted to do with their new work when they got, got to England. But let's just set the stage a little bit. And King James was the king, and unfortunately, uh, despite the fact that his uh, name is uh, on the most famous Bible of all time, and uh, just an absolutely beautiful uh, translation of the, of the Word of God in the King James version, um, King James was no friend of religious liberty. He was, uh, in fact, he was he was terrible on the issue. Uh, there had been a, a conference of Puritan pastors. Um, with King James, the, a thousand pastors had signed a petition. He selected some of their leaders. They had a, a, a multi-day conference at one of the castles uh, just on the north side of London. I've been to the castle and looked it over. And um, in that, um, King James said to the Puritan, past, Puritan pastors that they would give up their Puritan ways and come back to the high church format of the Church of England, or that he would harass them out of their land. And uh, or worse, meaning he would kill them. And he, he was true to his word. Uh, he did exactly those things. Um, and so uh, Thomas Helwes and company were heading back to England to face certain persecution. In fact, Helwes was arrested and spent the balance of his life in King's Bench Prison, which was shortened by the cruel treatment he, he received there uh, at the, uh, not at the direct hand of King James, but at, under the policies that he had that prison run under. Um, the church they were gonna plant couldn't be called a church um, because only the Church of England could be called a church. And so Baptist churches quite, uh, had uh, Baptist um, um, chapels and meeting houses and other names, euphemisms for churches because uh, religious freedom alternatives were simply not permitted. Now it's in that setting that the these these uh, missionaries back to England wrote down their most important principles and their most important principles included this one that when the elders of the church were spread so thin that they didn't know everybody in the congregation that it was time to divide the church up and and break off and start a new work and a new church and so they wanted to have uh, elder leadership that was directly involved uh, and able to minister and shepherd the lives of the people. And so, you know, was I, I was reading that, 
And it just jumped off the page at me when I first read about this work from reading Thomas Helwes's original work. They were facing certain persecution and what they were worried about was mega churches. I mean, it's just an astounding idea that, uh, that this was a concern of theirs. And I purposed when I first learned this, and I still purpose on a, perhaps a daily basis, um, to, I want to live that kind of life. I want to live with the kind of faith and confidence in God that I'm worried about being blessed so much in the ministry that I'm in, the endeavors that I'm involved with, that I'm worried about mega churches, the equivalent or the equivalent thereof. Um, and so, so let's take a, a, you know, that attitude and now look at our current situation. Um, of course, President Biden has declared himself to be an open opponent of virtually every principle that Christians would place priority on in, in terms of uh, what they want from public policy from the federal government, uh, on whether it's the issue of pro-life, whether it's the issue of sexual sanity, um, whether it's you know any number of, of moral or even fiscal issues. Uh, what, what President Biden stands for and, and is advocating for and pushing uh, very, very rapidly, uh, and we're talking about some of those pushes in just a few minutes, uh, is just the opposite of everything that we believe. Um, there is uh, you know, the threat of court packing. Now, it doesn't look like it's going to go someplace instantaneously, but it's, this is being done with a, with a lot of influential people backing it, and it, it's being done for a purpose. And so uh, we have to take it seriously. Then we've got philosophies that are out about critical race theory is an incredibly dangerous philosophy. And I, I want to say this uh, among my 26 grandchildren, I have three black grandchildren and it's just a plain reality and not a pleasant reality, not a reality that I'm going to accept that my black grandchildren are going to experience a different, it, different issues in life that my white grandchildren will never face. And that's not fair and that's not right. And I don't want to put up with that. And I want to do what we can to make that happen. But critical race theory is a morally bankrupt Marxist theory that is not about all people being treated equally. It's something that every person, especially every Christian, should embrace. This is about redistributing power and other theories that um, have very little to do with race and much to do with a uh, power-hungry theorist and who want to uh, um, go completely away from the, the, the historically wonderful positions of people like Frederick Douglass, who said the, the founding of America was based on great principles, but we didn't live up to the principles. It's time to live up to them was his call uh, in the pre-Civil War era. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said you know, to live up to those principles in his famous speeches, uh, letter from the Birmingham jail and his I have a dream speech and others. And so critical race theory is a very dangerous thing, and it's, it's out and about. Um, I just read today that uh, a hospital in the Boston area has decided to, to uh, um, use uh, racial preferences, uh, according to critical race theory, in, order, in the dispensing of, of medical care in their hospital. Um, then we face the LGBT agenda and their desire to have coerced uniformity. And everybody must bow the knee, use the pronouns, do the weddings, bake the cakes, all the things that they want to do that, you know, I, I confronted um, our State Department for its advocacy of, of LGBT issues at a, at a public hearing a couple of years ago. And a lesbian priest of the Episcopal Church came up to me afterwards and said, we just want everyone to celebrate us. That's all. I mean, like, in other words, she wants me and people who believe like I do who think it's, this is a violation of what God teaches to celebrate that which is evil. And uh, the coerced uniformity is going to lead as uh, Justice uh, um, Jackson said in the famous flag salute case from West Virginia in the 1940s called West Virginia versus Barnett. He said the uniformity of, that comes from the coercion is the only uniformity of the graveyard. And that's what they're willing to do. I mean, they, they, uh, socialism, and uh, its branches, uh, the LGBT and uh, critical race theories are all embedded and intrinsic in the beliefs of socialism, which are intrinsically by their very nature. They, they cannot help it. They cannot escape it. They are anti-God and they are coercive and they are violent. And, and it's in that context, 
when I, you know, and more. I could go on and on about it and talk about the big corporations. But it's in that context. I want to talk to you about why you should have a lot of hope and why I think we got we, we can win and why uh, at ADF we call these generational wins. Now, let me explain where uh, the, the term generational wins comes from. And it comes from a context all of you will be familiar with. It comes from the homeschooling world. Uh, it's, it's a term I, I coined to describe what happened over the first 25 years or so of the battle for freedom for homeschooling. Uh, when Zan and I uh, were in the early days of homeschooling, many others were as well. Um, our family started homeschooling in 1982. Um, if you asked all the state attorney generals, all 50 of them, is it legal to homeschool in your state? All 50 would have said, no, that's not legal in our state. Now, even as a matter of statutory law, that, that a couple of them would have been wrong. And as a matter of constitutional law, I contended they were all wrong. But in terms of actual practice, that was the reality on the ground in the early 80s, that it was thought to be illegal in every state. Now, if you ask that same question today, um, 35 or so years later, and ask the question almost almost 40 years later, um, is it, you know, all, all 50 attorney generals would say, of course it's legal to homeschool. Now, some of them wouldn't like that answer, but all of them would acknowledge that it's legal to homeschool in, in every state now. That is a generational win. And that was a win achieved over the objection of the most powerful forces in every state legislature, which is the teachers union, when they were aided by the superintendents association, and they were aided by the Department of Education, and they were aided by the principals association, and so on. So the entire education establishment, which has enormous power in every state legislature, well, we eventually, over 25 years, we won. And that's because of God's blessing and because of faithful work and grassroots and lots of reasons we want. The fact is, we won. And so it's based on that. When the, when the uh, uh, executive search firm came to me to approach me to consider taking the, the job I have today, Alliance Defending Freedom, the reason I, I took it ultimately was this. I saw issues that ADF works on where we were, we were like the early days of homeschooling, where if you ask all the attorney generals, is this, you know, is religious freedom in a good position? Is right to life in a good position? And so on. The answer would be no. We're in a bad position in all those, all those states. And I believe that God can get, deliver generational wins in all the five areas that, that ADF works on. So let me just give you a, a brief uh, introduction to what those five areas are and how I, uh, you know, what a generational win in these areas looks like. Now, I'm not going to tell you the details of how we're going to get there, but I'm just going to tell you what it looks like once we win. So the first is the right to life. And, and our goal is to see that life is safeguarded. That means automatically, of course, that we are going to, we're working, we're working today. We work, we work constantly on Roe versus Wade being reversed. But that's not the ultimate goal. It's a big interim goal, a huge interim goal. But that will just return the issue to the states. And, and so um, our goal is for right to life to pre be protected from conception until natural death in all 50 states. And we have a plan on how, how that's going to work. And, uh, it, you know, it will, take, it will take time after Roe versus Wade to do that. We'll start off with about 11 to 12 states that will be pro-life immediately, and then with a little bit of, of work, we can get another 10 or 12 states to join that. And with a little more work, we think we can get up to around 30 states that are pro-life by the normal processes. And then we think we'll have the, the political power uh, at that stage to move to a, a federal constitutional amendment and move to all 50 states being protected. So that's the goal, is life is safeguard. Similarly to that, we want to see religious freedom guaranteed. Uh, this involves reversing a decision called the Employment Division versus Smith. Many of you have heard of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, you certainly have heard that Hobby Lobby had a case in the Supreme Court where they didn't want to be forced to uh, provide uh, abortion funding in their medical insurance for their employees. And they won their case, not on the First Amendment as they should have, um, because the Supreme Court has a bad First Amendment case called Employment Division versus Smith. And that case jettisoned the free exercise of religion from any meaningful protection in most cases. And so um, uh, they used instead the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, a federal act 
passed in, the, in 1994 when the Democrats were in control of both houses of Congress. Uh, I'm the guy who named the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That's just because at the original meeting, when we decided we were going to write this thing, um, the uh, no, you know, somebody said, well, what are we going to call it? And I suggested RIFRA, and uh, uh, nobody else had another suggestion, so that was it. So I, I guess I'm the guy who named uh, the, the, the law, and I was the chairman, the co-chairman of the, of the group of lawyers who wrote it. And I was part of the executive leadership that uh, pushed it through Congress, and it eventually passed. And so the um, um, we we want to see religious freedom guaranteed once again as a matter of the First Amendment, because RIFRA only protects you against the federal government. It no longer applies uh, to the state governments um, because of another bad Supreme Court decision in, in the interim. Our third generational win that we're working on is freedom of speech. And our, our goal is to see freedom of speech protected for all, principally against government attacks, but we're also working against uh, on the issue of freedom of speech in the private context, in Facebook, in Google, Twitter, in, in these contexts. We're, we're working to, to uh, uh, establish and protect freedom of speech. And that's tricky because private companies do have rights, but there are free speech considerations as well. And so we're working uh, both with uh, uh, political and non-political and non-legal means to try to, to uh, advance the freedom of speech. And, and it's got to be for everybody. It's not, there's no such thing as hate speech. Um, really, there is only speech somebody hates. And the Constitution protects speech that we don't like. The old saying is the true saying. And that saying was, I may disagree with everything you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. That saying was describes the essence of America in many ways. And that saying is something that conservatives these days believe. But many liberals have left their moorings I mean, the ACLU is completely gone on this issue. Uh, now, some of the old-time ACLUers, like Nadine Strauss and their former president, stand, stood to her ground. And, you know, I, I give her great credit for continuing to stand for free speech on a principled basis. But most of them have, have, have given up, and they no longer uh, in, embrace uh, freedom of speech. Uh, and so um, I had the privilege of arguing a freedom of speech case in the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, 2018, um, on behalf of California's pro-life pregnancy centers. And they were being forced by the state of California to deliver a pro-abortion message. They didn't want to deliver it. On a five to four vote, we were successful in getting the Supreme Court to say, no, that's a violation of the free speech clause. Justice Thomas wrote the very excellent opinion. Um, so that's our third generational win that we're working on. Fourth is that God's definition of marriage and sexuality would be reestablished. And that re requires the overturning of two Supreme Court decisions. And in many respects, that, that's going to be the hardest of all. Um, both the Obergefell same-sex marriage case has got to be overturned. And the uh, Bostock decision from last term on uh, uh, transgender and uh, LGBT rights in the employment context is going to have to be overturned as well. The fifth and final uh, of our generational wins is that parental rights would be once again considered a fundamental right. And that doesn't require us to reverse a Supreme Court decision. It rather requires us to clarify that. And that can be done through a parental rights amendment to the U.S. Constitution or by a Supreme Court decision. And I'm, I'm hopeful with the uh, three justices that uh, President Trump was able to name to the court that we actually have a very decent shot of taking a parental rights case to the Supreme Court of the United States and getting to declare Troxel, uh, or excuse me, clarify Troxel, so that we can uh, see uh, a, a victory there uh, at the Supreme Court level uh, pretty quickly. So, how does ADF intend to, to do all this? Uh, now, I first want to, want to point out that uh, the name of the organization starts with the first word of Alliance. So, our first name is Alliance. We know we can't do that alone, and so we are dependent upon many other fine organizations, both nationally and, and especially at the state level, state family policy councils, uh, state home school groups, particularly on the parental rights issue. Um, but uh, uh, we, we believe that, uh, and then just individuals will help. We have 3,000 plus allied attorneys. And, and so um, with and through the alliance and by the blessing of God, there are four principal ways that we intend to advance these generational wins. And I, I really believe we can win. Um, and uh, 
those are litigation. That's principally what ADF does. We have, we're the largest um, Christian oriented or conservative oriented, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, nonprofit legal organization in the world. We have over 300 employees, 75 lawyers, and uh, we're growing rapidly. Um, and so um, we've grown about 50% in the four years I've been CEO. And I, I believe that we'll reach 500 employees within the next three or four years and um, uh, pass 100 lawyers clearly easily. Um, and so we, litigation is our, our main uh, contribution to this cause. We work somewhat on le legislation as well, and we work in, in uh, uh, alliance with many others like Family Research Council and the State Family Policy Organizations, the Heritage Foundation and others on legislation and that, that matters. And then we educate the public because if, if, if the public and especially our children don't understand these principles, uh, our hope for the future is diminished indeed. So we need to make sure that we're educating our own and, and our, the church family, our own families, and then the general public that will listen uh, on why religious freedom is important, why freedom of speech is important, and, and so on. Uh, and then for finally, and probably most importantly, prayer. We are uh, uh, convinced that without organized prayer, and our goal is to have five to 10 million people who are praying, not for ADF per se, although we hope we pray for some, but the principal thing is to pray for America, that America will be a nation that honors life, honors religious freedom, honors parental rights, honors the freedom of speech, honors God definition of marriage and sexuality. We're praying for America, that America will become that kind of a nation. And we, we are not trying to hijack everybody's prayer groups. We're just asking to have your existing prayer groups uh, add our prayer requests to your list. And so the National Day of Prayer Initiative has uh, already agreed to do this, as well as Intercessors for America. We're working with many churches and denominations to, to do that as well. So you have a prayer uh, group that you uh, want to uh, add to our list, please go to our website and look for our prayer initiative and, and sign up. Now, we're going to have a, a, a new launch of a, a prayer-focused uh, website on May the 4th. So it won't be long. You'll have a dedicated website just for this purpose. So to wrap up this point, and then we'll go to uh, questions. Why do I think we can win? Um, well, let me give you an ADF example, then I'm going to give you a homeschool example. Um, you, many of you know uh, the case. In fact, I would assume almost every one of you know the case of Jack Phillips and Masterpiece Cake Shop from Colorado. Uh, Jack, by the way, is a homeschool dad. You know, his kids are grown now, but he was a homeschool dad and a very faithful homeschool dad. And um, uh, his case on whether or not the, the state of Colorado could force him to make same-sex wedding cakes went to the Supreme Court. And the uh, um, the LGBT movement picked the kind of case they wanted. They picked the jurisdiction they wanted to come from. They picked the timing of it. They even were glad when Justice Kennedy stayed on the court one extra year beyond what people thought he was going to do because they knew he was such an advocate for LGBT rights. They had all the things lined up for them to have a victory in that area. And people were telling us we shouldn't bring this case to the Supreme Court. Other legal experts told us we shouldn't bring this case to the Supreme Court because it'll go badly for us. Well, we won that case seven to two in the Supreme Court of the United States. And I don't believe that's because, you know, just because we worked hard and did the lawyering, we did work hard. We did work hard indeed. And we, uh, Kristen Wagner, who's my general counsel, my second in command here, did a terrific job arguing the case. But I am absolutely convinced that we won this case through the power of prayer. Now, let me, the homeschool example is perhaps even a little more clear, although that one's pretty clear to me as well. Um, many of you will remember, some of the old timers will remember in 1994, there was a bill in Congress called H.R. 6. It was the Elementary and Secondary Education Funding Act. And um, there was a, a congressman, George Miller, from Contra Costa County, California, uh, the county that my wife Vicki and I were uh, recently married, as long as uh, your definition of recently means 1971 is recently, compared to the age of America or the age of the earth, it was recent. And um, but we'll be 50 years in our, our wedding uh, anniversary uh, come this coming September 4th. Um, but um, uh, 
Congressman Miller had a provision in this massive bill that said all teachers in America had to be certified in every course that they, they teach, which would have been bad for public schools and certain specialization concepts. For example, a, a high school history teacher who was a, a debate champion in college couldn't teach the debate course because he wasn't certified in language arts and, uh, and computer science. Uh, uh, somebody who's really good at that, but they were certified in some other subject, couldn't teach the computer class. So um, it would be bad in, in, in private schools. You know, I, I've taught at the collegiate level. I'm clearly qualified to teach high school government, but it, I couldn't teach high school government at a private school, even though I've got, you know, tons of college degrees that are relevant um, because I wasn't certif a certified teacher. But it was most dramatically would just kill the homeschooling movement. And uh, it, it, you would have to be certified in elementary education to teach at that level. And you have to be certified at the secondary level in everything in order to teach a child seventh through 12th grade. So um, it would be about 1% of the homeschooling movement could have uh, done the uh, elementary schooling and no one could have taught after the seventh grade if this provision had passed. And, and so, um, you know, this is 94, Dick Army called me up and said, um, his congressman from Texas has said, uh, you know, am I reading this bill correctly? Because he had tried to strike it on a, on a committee vote. It just came up out of nowhere. And uh, the Democrats who were in control of Congress uh, voted all for it. And the Republicans all voted against it. And it passed. And eight days later, it was going to be on the floor of the House to pass again. And in that eight days, uh, we called out the Army. We mailed snail mail letters. Al Gore had not invented the Internet yet or at least hadn't invented email yet. And so we didn't have email addresses. We mailed old fashioned letters to people. We had telephone trees. Uh, I went on radio programs. First was on Marlon Maddox uh, point of view program. Marlon was one of the co-founders of uh, Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, and that really took off. Now, we estimate we had 100 to 200,000 calls in the first two days, which is a really good showing. And then uh, on Friday afternoon, on the way down, I was driving down to uh, Virginia Beach from Northern Virginia, and I stopped in Williamsburg at a homeschool family's house and recorded uh, Focus on the Family with Dr. Dobson. And that was played on Monday morning, and the jet took off. And at the end of eight days, Newt Gingrich told me that he thought there were three million phone calls that came in in the eight-day period. The morning of the vote came. I knew we were going to win. Uh, because of all the feedback we were getting, and I was, you know, getting ready to drive down to the house, sit in the house gallery and watch this uh, historic moment uh, as a fun activity for the day. And instead, I got a call from Dick Army's chief of staff said, Mike, we've got a problem. And I said, what's the problem? He said, the, there is a uh, private school group that thinks that we're, we'll hurt their ability to participate in certain federal programs by this language. And, and I said, well, that's easy to fix. Just do it. Da, 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 da. And he said, well, yeah, that's that would work. But we can't just do that. We have to have permission from the rules committee to do that or else this is going to be put back for six months and be brought up again in a very much later stage. And everybody knew that we had taken the NEA by surprise. And if we had to wait six months, there was no telling what was going to happen. I said, so, so Army's guy, I said, so what do we do? And he said, well, you need to get uh, calls into Joe Moakley's office right now asking for permission, rules permission to do this. I said, okay. So I called the president of the Massachusetts Homeschool Association, told her what the deal was, and she said, I don't understand exactly, but we'll do it. And so that's all I could do. Now, at this point at HSLDA, uh, we were getting so many calls that we couldn't handle that either. We had half of our staff answering calls, but there were some people, including my daughter, Jamie, who was a graphic artist. She was uh, 16 or 17 years old, and she uh, was um, there uh, working, and uh, um, she was told, you keep doing your job and don't answer the phones. Well, this, this particular morning, uh, there was a woman named Barbara who had a desk next to Jamie's, and Barbara stepped away from her desk for just a minute. And Barbara's phone was ringing and ringing and ringing. And something in Jamie's spirit said, pick up the phone. And she did. It was the second time she'd answered a call in that whole eight-day period. 
And it was Joe Moakley's chief of staff. And she transferred the call to me and he said, so how do we stop the phone calls? We're sick of the phone calls. And I said, you're sick of the phone calls. We're sick of the phone calls. Everybody's sick of the phone calls. But there's only one way to stop the phone calls. And that is you got to take a vote on the Army Amendment today. And so give us permission to make this modest change to the text. We'll take the vote today and the phone calls will stop. And he said, I understand. He didn't promise anything. He just said, I understand. If you were watching C-SPAN about 15 minutes later, you saw Dick Army and Joe Moakley talking on the floor of the House of Representatives. We talked about 45 seconds. They shook hands. 15 minutes later, they took the vote. And the Army Amendment, the Good Amendment, passed 422 to 1. We won. Now, we worked hard. And we did all we, we could do. And we did a lot. But at the end of the day, it was the Holy Spirit whispering into the, voice, into the heart of a 16-year-old girl and saying, pick up the phone that carried the day. I have seen God answer prayer. And in that time, the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress. President Clinton was in the White House. And they, we had just lost eight days earlier a straight party line vote on the same issue. So when I see the environment that we're in today, I think we're in a target rich environment. It's almost no place you can, you can, you know, take a figuratively speaking, uh, uh, you know, shoot your arrow and you're going to hit something because the, there, there's so many things that are out there wrong, but I'm convinced that if we do first things first and stand on God's principles, that all these things will be added onto us. And so I'm very, very, very confident that it's, it's going to be some deep water in the meantime, and it's going to be some hard days, just as there was deep water and hard days in the homeschooling movement in the early years. But we got through it. God was more than sufficient. And we came out the other side seeing the tremendous blessing and the win that we now call a generational win. I believe that all these things are possible in every one of the issues that I've described for you. And with your help and God's blessing, um, I, I believe it's going to happen in, in our lifetime. So with that, Zan, I'd be happy to answer questions. There's been a lot of things going on. On the side, I haven't been able to watch all of them. And if you come back and ask me some of the questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. All right. That'd be great, Mike. We've got a few. And then there's one that I want to end with. Um, somebody asked about Pastor Coates in Canada and wondered if we're at risk of this happening in the United States. Um, Pastor Coates in Canada is um, um, you know, something that there are, are Canadian allies that we're friends with with that I'm sure that they're engaged in that. I don't know exactly the role they were, they're playing there. But um, we were at great risk of this until very recently. Um, the, the Supreme Court has made some really good decisions and the, and the decision they made most recently on religious freedom in a church context and the COVID issue is so good. It was one of these midnight orders that uh, I, I think that the, the chances of this happening have been reduced to almost zero. Now, could somebody, local official, be so full of their own power-hungry uh, theory of themselves that they do it? Yeah, that could happen, but it won't stand because I think this. I think the Supreme Court's gotten this right, and things are moving in the right direction. We we litigated the case uh, in Nevada where the uh, um, churches were being treated worse than the casinos. And we first uh, we lost the first round of that case, but they eventually we won that case uh, in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And to win a religious freedom case in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals tells you changes are afoot. Yes. And so, uh, so I think that we're in a better position on that than than our brothers and sisters in Canada right now. Uh, ADF, by the way, did a, a similar. Uh, 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 we helped in a case in Scotland, very similarly. We won a, a victory there. So we, we we do work on these things. Uh, around the world. Um, okay, great. Thanks. So somebody, and you mentioned critical race theory earlier, somebody asked a question about people in her church that are embracing CRT and what's the best way to handle that? I know you said we've got to educate people. Do you have any practical suggestions on how we do that? Yeah. Um, Get them to read this book. I didn't write it, but it's a great book. It's just sitting right here. It's called Why Social Justice is Not Biblical Justice. 
um, written by a homeschool dad um, who uh, uh, spent the first 20 years of ministry in uh, groups that were aimed at, at feeding the poor. And so he's, he's a real heart for the, the real needs of people. And that heart comes out in the book. But he takes this on in a big way and explains why the whole social justice movement, including uh, critical race theory, is unbiblical. And I've, I've read the book. It's outstanding. And uh, I, I would say read that book and uh, get your friends to read that book. Um, okay. We got one question. Um, well, let me read this quote. Joe just found this for me. My husband, who's not a groupie, is president of Mike's fan club. So I'm going to look at <laughs> question um when a brave man takes us or this is just a comment when a brave man takes a stand the spine of others are stiffened and you mm. know like you do that for us because you've been so courageous it makes us more courageous and we appreciate that so much hey i've got i've got two more questions for you um yeah. i don't know if you'll remember this or not but years ago you were talking about homeschooling and the importance of the homeschooling movement because we were one of the the groups large enough to change a generation in, in yeah. terms of the way we're educating our kids. So now that the numbers of homeschooling have probably doubled, do you still have that hope for the homeschooling community? Oh, there's no doubt um, about that. Um, I, uh, you know, just a recent reminder of it. Um, Ken Starr, who's a good friend of mine, uh, was uh, teaching a guest course at Regent Law School. And he had me come in and do a, a lecture on um, the course of homeschooling law and how it went from bad to good. And so to tell a, you know, a, somewhat of the same story I've told today, but with more, a lot more legal details and how the cases went and, you know, what the legal things were and stuff. And um, uh, as we were getting started, um, uh, I asked how many of the, the law students had been homeschooled. Uh, and I don't remember exactly, but it was over overwhelming number of the law students in, in that, that class have been homeschooled at some point in their life. And, um, you know, of course, I see that at Patrick Henry and, uh, and, and in many other venues. I, I, I go places. I was, I was at a, um, a state legislative conference that David Barton was doing a few years ago, and I kept running into people who were both homeschool parents, and, and then there were even more who were uh, y the younger legislators, and a number of them were uh, homeschooled. And so I started that night, we started a, a, a political caucus of state legislators who had been homeschool, were homeschool graduates. And we called it the root beer float caucus because I took them out for what constitutes a heavy night of drinking Mike Forrest. I brought them out root beer floats. And, and so um, the, um, uh, you know, the, I, I see encouragement day in and day out. And, um, and you know, I would encourage moms to deliberately teach, uh, you know, the Constitution, teach good American history, do lots of things in that zone. But just by teaching them at home yourself, you're teaching them the most important lesson that kids need to learn, and that the government's not the supplier of our needs. God and my family and my own initiative, that's where we should supply our needs, because there are two basic views of government. One is, is the purpose of government is to supply our needs, that's socialism. And the other view is the purpose of government is what the Declaration of Independence says, is to protect with equal justice our God-given rights. And it says, for this cause, America, governments are instituted among men. It's for the protection of these rights. And, and, and these rights handed out and dispensed and managed equally. That's what it's all about. And so uh, you can have a freedom-loving um, orientation or you can have a socialism orientation and by homeschooling kids every mom is giving their kids a freedom loving orientation amen well you started me on my journey to learn the constitution and the founding documents and mike you've got a great speech that you delivered at patrick henry college graduation this year yeah. can you tell people how to get that i'll uh, just Google my name, and it's called uh, We Are Americans, and put my name in, We Are Americans, it'll come up. It's uh, um, both on the, uh, um, I think, well, certainly on the Patrick Henry College site. I also, it may be on the ADF site as well, because uh, okay. I've delivered it a couple of times. And so, that, That's a great speech yeah. to read to your high schoolers, by the way. Have them read that speech and begin to understand exactly why we're not like Mike saying we shouldn't be. 
Um, Mike, thank, do you have anything else you want to say? I know you need to go. This has been so great for us. Thank you so much. Well, I just want to um, thank all of you for being here today. And I just want to encourage you that um, um, I believe that homeschool families and especially homeschool moms are doing as much as anybody uh, for the good of the country. And for the reasons I've just articulated, you are training the next generation. And, you know, it would be wonderful to have a majority um, of kids who believe the right thing. But God then usually hasn't really historically worked through uh, majorities. It's through righteous remnants. And I am really glad that there, you all are raising up a righteous remnant that can um, be called upon. Uh, you know, there are other people in the remnant, and so we, we shouldn't get so arrogant that we don't think that we're, we're the only ones. But we're pr providing a disproportionate share of the righteous remnant. And for that, uh, the whole world should be grateful because uh, we are we're, we're in a very critical battle. But as I've said to you, I really believe we can win. I wouldn't be here if I, I didn't believe we could win. And, uh, you know, don't ever, you know, get a lawyer or a pastor or anybody that's supposed to be your advocate who doesn't believe they can win and, and really believes them. They're not just saying that they really believe it. And uh, I believe it because I've seen God work. So um, yeah. God's done it before. It's, it, it is not contrary to his nature to do it again. In fact, it is absolutely consistent with his nature to do it again. So God bless you. Thank you all. I appreciate you very much. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you.